Hi, everybody. Welcome back once again. This is Mark Lawrence, and we're all set to go against the spread on this week number three of the National Football League card, week number four in college football, if you can believe it. And with it, we've got a couple of new twists on the show today. But before we get to that, I want to remind our viewers out there to please subscribe to our podcast here. We have a goal of reaching a thousand subscribers by the end of the season, and we're on our way there. Please help us out. Hit the subscribe button down below and join the cast of subscribers who put a thumbs up endorsement on this show. If you will, I'd appreciate that. With that, I want to welcome to the show our cast of experts, our panel of experts on the show this week. Victor King from King Creole Sports and the Playbook Totals Tip Sheet. Victor, how are you doing these days? Mark, uh, I'm doing good. We're off a good weekend. Not quite as good as the uh, Mark Lawrence weekend, but uh, for us, Three and one in college football over unders. Uh, we had our four star NFL game of the week, and that was on the Cowboys and Saints over the total. Uh, when you bet an over an NFL game, you love cashing a winner at halftime, don't you? And that was indeed the case. These two teams combined for 53 points at the half. Final score was 44 to 19. And for you trivia experts out there, the final score in that Cowboy game was a score gami. So you ask, what is a score gami? A score gami is an NFL final score that's never occurred before in the past. Wow. We've never, we've never had a final score of 44 to 19. And there you go. Cowboys and Saints, not only they, did they provide us with a really nice, fun winner, but a score gami as well. But hey, we got to talk about the, the main man. And of course, that would be Mark Lawrence with an outstanding weekend. Uh, it started on Saturday with that four-star best bet on Kentucky. Right, Mark? They almost pulled off the outright win against Georgia. Almost didn't even need the points in that game. But Kentucky is a four-star best bet. And then, Mark, went a perfect 4-0 and in the NFL Sunday-Monday games. Let me just run through these, Mark. The four-star best bet Cincinnati Bengals almost pulled off the win. Covered. Uh, with the points against the Chiefs. Three-star Minnesota Vikings, outright home dog win. Three-star Cleveland Browns, outright road dog win. Even a two-star winner on the Atlanta Falcons Monday night. Mark, mission accomplished. Yeah, it was mission accomplished, Victor. Thank you very much. And I can say this, that uh, when Kentucky did not win the football game, I was sort of second-guessing myself because I had these visions of playing that game on a money line and was regretting it all game long that I didn't do it. And all of a sudden, it ends up okay. Georgia winning the game. So I felt relieved in a sense. So, But it was a great weekend, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Well very, yeah, yeah very I, I actually put a few bucks on Kentucky's money line because of what you said when we were talking on the Our Lads uh, show. Right. I was like, really, Kentucky to win the game outright? Because you actually said that you thought that that was a, a shot. They could do it. Yes. And I was like, well, anything that's that's a shot with the, at that number, I'm going to take just in case. And yeah. By that, the way. I was going to say, Victor, the only thing about what you said about having the game ticket cashed at halftime is it's like betting an over in baseball and the score is like 11 to 9 after four innings and it gets called off because of rain. I don't know if they have the same rule offshore that they have in Vegas, but the game has to be official. Uh, it has to go 55 minutes or uh, all bets are refunded. So You're right that, about that. It, it, although that's a nice thing to have to sweat. Yeah, the, uh, it, it, it's like betting under. You have to sweat the whole game to cash your under ticket. Yeah. The overs, like Victor says, it's nice to have it cashed at the half. It's real nice. When you're betting an under, guys, in in whether it's college football or the NFL, and you're forcing yourself to watch it on TV, and you feel it slowly slipping away, the thing I compared that to is death by a thousand cuts. That's what <laughs> it is when you bet an under, watch it, and it slowly slips away. Yeah, Thank goodness for in-game wagering that most places right. have right now. Tony Mejia, Playbook Experts, Sporting News contributor. How was your week last week, Tony? My week sucked, uh, but I uh, I did I, I missed you guys last week. Yes, because, uh, we took the show over a day, and Thursdays are more complicated than Wednesdays. I had a great week once. I would have been saying my week was great if I had been on last week. Uh, um, but this week, no, I I am very annoyed. Uh, actually, hopefully that my football luck has changed because uh, the Falcons and Eagles under looked like it was slipping away there late. And if uh, if Jalen Hurts does not get picked off, I believe that that would have pushed for some. 
Although if you got in and waited at 46 and a half, that teetered at 46 and a half, 46. Uh, but I was at 46, uh, then we would have pushed and that would have been very annoying. Uh, but my, uh, my awful tale for half points was the uh, Bears and Texans, a game dominated by Houston, you know, dominating on the defensive end as I expected they would. And uh, really, I mean, there, there weren't any mistakes. Stroud maybe missed some throws, but he was pretty solid and, and obviously orchestrated great plays. But that uh, goal line fumble uh, by Cam Akers there late really killed it. You're up nine, looking to go up 15 with you know, roughly five, six minutes left. Uh, laying six and a half, then uh, you're, you're feeling pretty good. But instead, uh, Cairo Santos field goal and my six and a half best bet blew up. So very annoyed there. College football was uh, eh. So uh, we were looking for a bounce back week three. By the way, Tony, the other the other thing you had to sweat out was that 48 yard extra point at the end of the Atlanta Philly game that would have sent it to overtime at 21 21 if he missed it. That's true. Yeah, that's right. true. Well, although uh, I'll say this, college football kicking looks improved this year, and NFL kicking, if it's inside of 55 yards, it looks automatic. So uh, these kickers are on their game early. Tony, on. Tony, even the the, the the greater than 55s have been amazing this year in the NFL. Yeah. Uh, I published a stat in the totals tip sheet this week about Justin Tucker and the fact that he has yeah. he's the one kicker in the NFL that has – struggled in his long distance kicks this year he's 0 for 2 in 50 or more yards with that said every other team in the nfl this year is 35 out of 37 in 50 yard or longer field wow. goals people are getting stuck in the red zone they're getting stuck at the 30 40 yard line scoring is down big time last week's games only averaged 39.2 points per game uh only five overs 10 unders one tie last week there are a myriad of reasons why scoring is down, but the long-distance field goal kicking is actually up. You know, it's strange, guys, is when you're watching these attempts uh, and you're looking at it from the end zone view between the goal posts, like most viewers are, and you're watching these kicks and they're coming at you and they're dead straight. You know they're going to make it. You know they're going to make it. And you don't even stop to realize that it was a 55-yard field goal or it was a 52-yard field goal. <laughs> they look like they were 28, 30-yard field yeah. goals. And that's, that's why auto- they, should, they should always show the view from behind the kicker. Because you want to see the flight of the ball and put the right. distance into perspective. And you can see if it's starting to tail off a lot better when you're looking towards where it's going as opposed to towards where it's coming. And I think they could do a, a last uh, second switch there, Andy, too. Start off behind the kicker and finish it up behind the goalpost. You know? Some Tucker is washed uh, tweets got out there. So <laughs> that's reason number uh, 155 why you shouldn't uh, follow NFL games on Twitter. Wow, nice. Greg De Palma. I know there were a lot of big underdog winners last week in the football cards, straight up type like winners. How was your week last week? I had some moments. Uh, the NFL was definitely better, though, as far as those upsets. Like, you, you went over them. Uh, uh, it would have been even better if Cincinnati had won. And I couldn't understand when I saw that. Uh, look, the whole fourth and 16 thing. Uh, I understand why everybody is upset that's not a Chief fan or had money on the Chiefs as far as uh, the call being made. Because to be honest with you, I think I've seen that call not be made. Sometimes it's made, sometimes it's not. But it's the Chiefs and it's Mahomes, so it's going to be made. Um, But you wind up being more upset at the Bengals because I was like, I was looking at that guy who made the play and I'm like, who is that? So I had to go on to the Arleds depth chart to find out who the number 33 was. And oh, that's a rookie. I said, but this guy is not even like a, a top draft pick. Why is he in the game at a crucial time? So I looked up and found out he had only played in like 15 snaps the entire season. And the excuse by the defensive coordinator was, well, in training camp, he did this, that, and the other thing. He deserved to be out there. You know, he's an aggressive guy. We teach our players to be aggressive, and that's what he was. He was aggressive, and, you know, that's it. That was his explanation. It's like... I'd still, why is he out there? Uh, nobody else is hurt. Uh, so anyway, you know, that's what happens when you leave it up to a rookie in the NFL uh, to make a, a play like that at the end of the game. Well, you, you know something? You bring up a, a sort of a point here that with the NFL now embracing gambling, it's even more important to the NFL to maintain their integrity. As a result, they really should not disallow a, ch- a challenge 
from being used on, let's say, a pass interference penalty that's called. It might be a little different on one that's not called, but if there's one that's being called, especially at a critical point of the game, let that be subject to review because you can often make a case that both guys are jostling and touching each other and there should have been a no call and the penalty should more likely than not have, been, have, have never been thrown and should be overruled. Or at the very least, use the college rule for pass interference penalties, make it a spot foul, except maybe in the last two minutes of the game so that you preserve an opportunity for a team to move down and use uh, some big plays. But even then, I still would prefer not to have pass interference uh, not be challengeable. You know, you mentioned rookies, and uh, I came across this, guys, and I, I still can't believe it, but what I read is that reading the review of the San Francisco Rams game this weekend, how literally it's a mash unit. Uh, just both teams are just decimated with injuries. And uh, one of the reporters reported that uh, it's San Francisco who has had 17 rookies on the roster this season. Now that could be the regular roster or it could be the practice squad roster, but 17 rookies and six of which are free agents. That's how the injury situation is in San Francisco these days. Hmm. I think another thing that probably happens too is is when you're a team like the Niners, you get poached, so you lose a lot of veterans, and then you and then you you've got a lot of high price guys, and you have to make do, and you've got to make do, and that's why they've done such a great job is because Lynch and their scouting staff have done a great job with making sure that there's players, not just the draft picks, but free agents and so forth, uh, that wind up making the team because they they need it. They have to find they have to figure out a way to add these young players to an expensive, talented roster. You know, you bring up that point, John Lynch, as good of a player he was as he was, and he was a great player, he may be as good, if not better, as a general manager with the, the all the personnel changes that uh, have benefited the team under his leadership. I think you're 100% spot on on that, Andy. And just a note to our listeners and our viewers out there that uh, we are going to twist it up a little bit on the show, a little bit in the last segment of the show. We're going to have what we call a, a playbook high five. And I'm going to ask all the experts uh, about five games of what their favorite game is on the particular card. So you want to stay through to the end for that new segment on the show here this week. And I also want to let you know that the Playbook Football Newsletter is now available online at playbooksports.com. And what a beauty it is this week. 18 jam-packed pages. Inside here, we're going to tell you what you're going to find in there. A little bit of a teaser coming up here. But you're going to find an underdog who is 3-0 straight up and against the spread this year has won the yards over 138 yards on football game, and they're the underdog in the contest. You've got another college football head coach that's a perfect 7-0 and to the spread in his career in conference games when he's coming off a straight-up loss as a favorite. Such a coach is in that role this week. And how about a college football team averaging 56 points a game this season whose coach is 66-8 and against the spread in games in which his team scores 30 or more points? That looks like a handful. It looks like almost like a gimme, like a steal. You got a college football team out there that's 16 and one to the spread as a dog, of fewer than 17 points playing this week, and in the National Football League, an NFL division dog that is 15 and one straight up in its last 16 games, taking points from a division rival this particular week. There's a whole lot of that and a whole lot more inside the Playbook Football Newsletter this week. I encourage you to go online now at PlaybookSports.com and download your copy just in time for the football games this weekend. And by the way, if Mark gave me an opportunity, I would go, you know what? I can, I can, I can give you 10 of those uh, and, and match you uh, with all sorts of great trends <laughs> from the magazine. So, uh, yeah, because this is because I, I don't get the newsletter until Wednesday. So uh, I'm like, I'm already into the magazine on Monday and Tuesday and early on Wednesday. And, and, and when I get the newsletter, that's just like icing on, on top. I thought you were going to tell me you could top that with more numbers like that inside the newsletter, but I get where you're coming from, Greg, with that magazine, that football preview guide magazine. That's got chock full of nuts, really, really good stats inside of it. Let's you get know, to you our... You know, Mark, I was just yes. going to say I can add an additional tease on your divisional rival thing. Yes. It'll make people, they're going to do have to do the research. I believe there's only two divisional games this week. Well, that they, that cuts the work uh, the workload down, down quite a bit. But, but now, you, now you have to do the work or you're just going to be taking a guess. Yeah, and you're going to be surprised at who the team is too, Andy, <laughs> when you take okay. a look at it. But nonetheless, uh, it's on the card this particular week. 15-1 straight up against their division opponent, and they're a dog this week. Let's take a look at our featured college football game of the week. We're going to go in this particular contest inside the Big 12 Conference where Utah 
is a new member in the conference, and they're going to travel to Oklahoma State and Stillwater to take on the Cowboys. We're going to go around the horn to get the comments of each of our experts here on this particular football game. Uh, first of all, we'll kick it off with you, Andy, here. How do you see this football game between Utah and Oklahoma State on Saturday? Well, both teams are 3-0 and and have long-term successful coaches. Uh, Kyle Whittingham of Utah, 164-79 straight up. Almost an identical record for Oklahoma State's uh, Mike Gundy. He's 169-79 and straight up. They're both in season number 20 as uh, coaches, uh, as, as head college coaches at their respective institutions. Uh, Utah's uh, oft-injured quarterback rising has been upgraded to probable, uh, which did cause a significant shift in the uh, line move. Hokie State opened about a three-point favorite. Utah is now favored by two, so that's a significant adjustment. Uh, over the summer, the Westgate had this game listed as a pick 'em, and that maybe uh, suggests that they actually like Utah a little bit better because this game being on uh, home surface would say that if this were on a neutral surface, Utah would be the uh, uh, the choice. I actually well, like Amanda. Oklahoma. You said that line changed. Uh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, from, not from where it opened, from where it was over the summer. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, I believe I believe the game was a, a pick 'em over the summer, uh, and now. Uh, uh, the adjustment has been made. Both teams have started off playing well. Uh, Oklahoma State, of course, had that scare against Arkansas, but it also showed their medal as far as coming back uh, from a big deficit and ended up uh, winning in overtime and uh, frustrating uh, those who did not get eight and a half or more on Arkansas in a game that they were covering uh, the entire contest. Um, I like Oklahoma State. Uh, both of these teams, Utah and Oklahoma State, uh, playing um, uh, amongst, I guess you'd say, sort of start to say they, Kansas and Kansas State, were probably the four top contenders to win the Big 12 championship this year, This year, which will be interesting with uh, Texas and Oklahoma no longer in the conference. I like Oklahoma State as a home dog. I do like uh, both coaches. These are two teams that I'm looking to bet on uh, uh, throughout the season, but if they're playing each other as they are this week, and I think either team is capable of winning at home or on the road, I'll take the home underdog. Andy Isco on the home underdog Oklahoma State Cowboys in this football game. Don't tell Gundy that he's a home underdog in this football game. He doesn't need any more to get his troops riled up for the contest. Victor, how do you see Oklahoma State and Utah shaking out on Saturday? Well, Andy covered the uh, line moves in the game, so we don't have to run through that. It looks like another hot day there in the Sooner State. Somewhere in 94, 95 degrees. It's going to be hot. Only 15% chance of rain. Manageable winds. Oklahoma can be a windy place, obviously. But uh, anything under 15 miles an hour would not be significant in regards to the uh, total. And it opened 52 with the cam rising probable news. It's actually gone up a couple of points. The last time I looked, it was currently at 54 uh, let's see here. Utah, one and two over under on the season, 47.6 points per game. Last week's game against Utah State without Cam Rising was surprisingly high scoring uh, for the Utes. Oki State, two and one over under on the season, 63.0 combined points per game. Uh, yeah, these two teams are in the Big 12, but obviously they don't play each other a lot. In fact, I think the last time they played was way back in 1945 when Oklahoma State was known as, I believe, Oklahoma A&M. Uh, the question in the game is how effective will Ryzen be uh, if he will be starting in this game? And you got a couple of uh, what you would consider to be veteran quarterbacks here taking on each other. Cam Rising's 24 years old, while Okie State's guy's 25 years old. That's That would be the Alan Bowman, their quarterback, the prudent play for totals betters would be to hold off until we get to Saturday afternoon sometime. Let's make sure Cam Ryzen is indeed playing in the game. We would do a final weather check before we consider the over in the game. As far as her stats go, it's all good for over betters. Utah, 422 offensive yards per game, 36.7 points per game. Oki State, even better, 446 on offense, 42.7 points per game on offense. And a weak defense, too, that's actually given up 463 yards per game. Dating back to last season, Utah's last four road games, true road games, 
have gone a perfect 4 and 0 to the over. Oki State is on a current run of 9 and 5 over under last 14 games, including 5 and 1 over under when playing at home. The current line of 54 still seems a little bit low for a Big 12 game, so uh, we'll hold off for now. We'll check things on Saturday, and chances are we'll be throwing a few bucks on the over uh, if Rising indeed plays in this game. Rising goes, Victor goes over in this football game for his side in the contest. Tony, let me ask you this question here. You're a National Football League general manager. You know the talent of the quarterbacks that are coming out in the draft. Cam Rising looks to be a first-round pick. Does his injury situation concern you any at all? This guy misses more games than he plays, and you wonder if not when he turns pro, will he be on the injured list more often than he won't? You think that's going to end up knocking him down in the draft order in the NFL draft? Only if they're concerned about his age, you know, being probably significantly older than the, the other top prospects. As far as, you know, what, what, what he brings to the table uh, coming off of an injury you know, riddled college uh, career, I think that you trust that you're going to be able to keep him clean. You definitely trust that he will be somewhat like Bo Nix in being able to come into the league and recognize defenses and recognize blitzes uh, probably better than what uh, the top two draft picks in this past draft, Williams and Daniels, have been able to do thus far. Uh, because that's going to help. And I think that to, to segue into this prediction, I think that's what's going to help Utah and Stillwater because this is a, a true road game, and last week's kind of was at Utah State. They hadn't played there in a while, um, and they missed Rising. They missed him early. Uh, it took them a little while. Zach Wilson's kid brother was actually the starting quarterback for the Utes, and he's really young. Uh, so, you know, having Cam Rising there is, uh, I mean, I, I can't think of, five other situations around the country where the starting quarterback makes more of a significant difference uh, as opposed to the backup than at Utah. I mean, you put Cam Rising on that team, they're a national championship contender. You take them off. Uh, I don't think that they are top three in the Big 12. So, you know, I think he'll be fine. This particular injury that he's got, it's, uh, it's something on his ring finger on his throwing hand. So we'll see if he's able to uh, be 100%. Uh, but sounds like he is. There's no uh, – they required stitches, so hopefully they don't open up. I'm not really sure uh, the particulars on that, if there's any concerns over that, other than I would I would be shocked if he doesn't play. Uh, sounds like he's probable. They'll also have Dorian Singer back, a key receiver for them. They've got Money Parks, their uh, number one. And so from that standpoint, I am concerned about Oklahoma State because defensively, they really struggled against Arkansas. That's really been the only team on their schedule that they played uh, that you can you can somewhat say, all right, well, how they do against a, a real offense or this early in the season. And uh, the Hogs did whatever they wanted. Uh, and Jaquindon Jackson, who started his career at Utah as, as a quarterback, actually, uh, he played really well, had t- tons of running lanes. Um, you know, the quarterback, uh, Taylor Green, who's uh, the Boise State transfer, he did whatever he wanted uh, and uh, as a dual threat. So I'd be concerned if I was Mike Gundy on, on, uh, about my defense. I'd be concerned about Alan Bowman, who, despite being 25 years old, as Victor said, uh, still makes really stupid mistakes. And this is, what, his seventh or eighth year in college. Uh, so uh, this is uh, that's that's troubling. So, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll, I think if Rising makes it through four quarters, I'm pretty confident Utah wins this game. Uh, so, uh, given the line move, if you want to play the money line, wouldn't hate on that. Certainly, I think the line move is 100% related to Rising being uh, assured to play as, as far as deemed probable. Well, they said last week that he dressed and he probably could have played in the football game. Uh, threw a few passes in the pregame and uh, looked as if... One, one quick thing, yes. one quick thing, just because I have it in my notes. Uh, the other reason why I'm, I'm not happy about uh, Oklahoma State or not, uh, you know, would advise against them is Ollie Gordon, uh, the running back. Who's, I think he led the nation in touchdowns last year. He is averaging three and a half yards mm-hmm. per carry over his, uh, right. you know, and, and has gained 90 yards over his last 34 carries. So wow. there's, a, there's a significant issue there going on because he, he's obviously legitimate. He, he'd be one of the top three running backs taken in this next draft. 
Uh, and I don't think that the issues are related to him. I would think the issues are related to that offensive line. Now that's a great point you bring up yep. there uh, also, Tony, because when I look at this Oklahoma State football team, you know, number one, they were loaded with returning production and starters. A lot of people thought they could steal or win the Big 12 Conference with Ollie Gordon obviously playing well, so forth and whatnot. They've gotten off to this 3-0 and start, but they've also allowed more yards than they've gained to begin the season three and zero this year, so they're not they're not hitting a, on a true three and zero start like most teams are. And I think there's some problems with this football team. They've also struggled in conference openers. The last take a look at them, uh, they're four seven and one to the spread, five and seven straight up in their last twelve conference opening games. Here, to me, it's a tough call. I was going to be all over Utah as a dog in this as game, dog. Yeah. as a dog. But they're not. Uh, in 78 and 39, that's a long-term dog. That's as good as any number in all of college football. But they're not. We can't talk about it. They're the favorite in the football contest. So I'm going to take a, a pass and watch this football game uh, from a distance. Greg DePalma, how do you see this game shaping up between these two Big 12 powerhouses? Well, before I get into the game, uh, just so you know, uh, because this is an easy trap to fall into. I, I, I've fallen into it a lot. And that is when you see a really good college quarterback and you just believe that, well, he's obviously going to be really good as a pro. But the fact is, is Cam Rising, scouting-wise, is not considered a top draft pick. And uh, matter of fact, I, I don't know if it's because of the injury, but if you noticed him lately, it, he's got a big caboose now. I mean, he walks off the field, and his and his ass is like, uh, you know, almost like it's an offensive lineman. It's like, dude, get in better shape. I mean, what are you doing? So, you know, especially when you're getting injured all the time, that's not a good look. So, does our lads project him as a first round pick? Do you know, Greg? At this point, no, uh, no. and um, and and they don't. They're not going to have uh, projections like that. Uh, I think Dave Syverson has early projections on like five top quarterbacks that'll probably that he has on the our lads uh, football YouTube channel. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, he's a guy that is probably just going to be more of in the lines of like, um, I don't know, maybe like a Jake Hayner type, you know, I think that's how they're going to look at cam rising at the next level. And to throw on top of what your point was is the guy's always injured. So, um, but as far as the game is concerned, this is what I wanted to do. See, I was, I was waiting for my opportunity to, you know, caress my, 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 playbook guide for all the great trends that, that they provide for me. And uh, I actually love the fact that Oklahoma State's a dog. And here is why. Oklahoma State in the last two years plus has won and covered all five of their games as a home dog. Won and covered. That's not easy to do. And they've also covered 12 straight as dogs of less than seven. When they take on an opponent off a straight-up win. Throw in the fact that Utah was only 4-9-1 against the spread as a road favorite. And 0-1 in that spot this year. And with rising, coming in and out. I'm not, I, I just can't go against Oklahoma State. I can't. It's like me playing the sheets with John Hardoon at horse racing. I don't care what everything says. If the sheets tell me one thing, I'm just going with it. I trust it. I'm going with it just like I'm going to trust and go with the playbook uh, trend that says uh, some really good things for Oklahoma State. I got you. Uh, live, you know, you live and die by uh, who you bring to the dance with you, and it sounds like that playbook guide goes everywhere with you, pretty much throughout the college football <laughs> season in the NFL season. Yeah. <laughs> that's a good except, that's except a good, under my except under my pillow. Does, I don't go. go that far. <laughs> you could learn by osmosis doing that too, Greg. Yeah, just a, I FYI. Could. Yes. <laughs> okay, guys, that's a look at our college football game of the week. It's a beauty inside the pack or the Big Twelve Conference. It's a much must watch game because it's also a possible Big 12 championship game preview. We could see these same two teams circling back and taking on each other once again at the end of the season in the title game. Uh, by the way, one more quick thing. Uh, you were talking yeah. about Ali Gordon. Just so you know, too, if you can re recall the fact that he was arrested in July for drunk driving, and that was a pretty big deal. Um, and coincidentally, he's off to a slow start. So it could be the offensive line, like Tony said, but – could be some other stuff as well. Well, where there's smoke, there's fire. That's all I'll say to that. Uh, you know, thus, it's not a real surprise to see him struggling, at least early on in the football season. You're tuned in to Mark Lawrence against the spread, the nation's most popular sports handicapping talk show. I'm visiting with our cast of experts, Andy Isco from TheLogicalApproach.com in Las Vegas. 
Victor King, the proprietor and editor of the Playbook Total's tip sheet, Tony Mejia, a Playbook expert and contributor to the Sporting News, and our good friend Greg De Palma, our host extraordinaire producer. By the way, as you gather by now, Jim Feist is not with us for the show this week. He will be back next week. We do hope to have Jim on board next week. With that, guys, let's move it over to now our NFL game of the week. And we've got a pretty nice football game on tap this week. We could have, we could have probably torn apart the Baltimore-Dallas game. It might have had a little bit more fan attention and appeal and so forth and whatnot. But you're still basically talking about two teams that are one and three on the season here, and it's not a lot of lack or luster. It's lacking a lot of luster. So we're opting instead to go to New Orleans where the Saints are going to play host of the Philadelphia Eagles this particular football season, or this, this week, I should say. Andy, how do you see these two teams, the Eagles and the Saints, on Sunday? Well, we talked a little bit about the the Eagles the other night uh, with uh, the, Tony was talking about the total and all that with uh, the sloppy play at the uh, uh, at the, the thing that surprised me in that game was Sirianni not going for the field goal in the first quarter uh, and you wasting a timeout to. Uh, decide to go for it after there was some running around on the field defensively. So uh, uh, his, his stock as a head coach is going down, and he's starting to feel some of the, uh, of the pressure. Now, unquestionably, the biggest positive story of the young season has to be uh, the play of the New Orleans Saints. Uh, their opening week 47-10 home win over, the, over Carolina drew some attention, but not as much was made of it given the opponent, Carolina. But the 44-19 win at Dallas last week raised uh, many an eyebrow. Uh, especially after Dallas had been impressive the week before in winning uh, on the road at uh, at Cleveland. Uh, Phillies win uh, over Green Bay uh, in Brazil featured an impressive uh, display of their offense, but the defense left much to be desired, allowing the pack uh, to gain 414 yards, including 163 on the, uh, on the ground. Now, one thing to keep in mind with Philadelphia is – that uh, they have new offensive and defensive quarters, uh, coordinators this year, and both are experienced veterans at the position. Uh, you have uh, Vic Fangio uh, coming over to take care of the defense and Kellen Moore uh, coming over to, uh, uh, to lead the offense. So I would expect to see tweaks and adjustments being made progressively throughout the season as these two uh, grizzled veterans adjust to the talent that they have and what's working and what's not working and things like that. Now, with the kind of performance that the Saints had, over the uh, first two weeks of the season, you would think that they would show some regression. I think the one thing that you, you have to really like, or two things you have to like about the uh, Saints is the play of uh, Derek Carr at quarterback and the reemergence of uh, Kamara as a uh, featured back as well after a couple of, well, for him, mediocre uh, seasons. Interesting, the line on this game had uh, Philadelphia a three-point road favorite over the summer yeah. in the advanced lines. Uh, when the Saints won, the line was again posted at three on uh, Sunday night, but the early money came in uh, on New Orleans, and this was, of course, before the Monday night tip-off when the line was taken off the board as the uh, Eagles played. It was bet down to, it had been bet down to uh, Philly still favored by only one and a half. After the uh, uh, Philly loss on uh, Monday night, the game was posted with New Orleans, about a two-and-a-half point favorite. Uh, it's a nice adjustment there, and it actually got bet up to three, and now it's pretty much settled in a two and a half. Uh, I kind of like this game as a situation where maybe a bit too much of an overreaction to the play of uh, of, of both teams. Although you certainly can't take anything away from what uh, New Orleans did at uh, at Dallas, I think that the line of Philadelphia three, at the very least, uh, may have been a little bit too high. Even if you said New Orleans was going to be improved maybe you could make a case for this game being even. So uh, with New Orleans now the favorite, it's almost like my uh, uh, Oklahoma State play, except uh, except here I'm looking to play on the quality road underdog. I'll be on Philadelphia. I'll either have to, I'll either have to buy at the three or take the uh, plus three if it shows up again. Yeah, lots of reactions happen uh, with Philadelphia for their poor play of late here. Nick Sirianni taking all kinds of heat in Philadelphia as well because of it. And the Saints off to this red-hot start. I mean, my goodness, 44 points, back-to-back -back football games. Uh, it's not very often you'll find that. But what you will find uh, when it comes to teams doing just like that, you'd think that there'd be a letdown out of the first two games of the season. But it really it completely is the other way around. If a team scores 44 or more their first two games of the season, they're 5-0 and outright in game three. Uh, but that was nice when they were a dog. They're not the dog anymore. 
Uh, they're going to the favorite, Andy says. So a lot of that value has gone completely out the window. Then you have Philadelphia. The last eight times they played on Monday Night Football, they're one six and one against the spread. Uh, it's, I'm still going to lean to uh, New Orleans in this football game. I just think Philadelphia has a lot of problems right now, and Vic Fangio is not the answer. And Victor can attest to this. When he was the defensive coordinator down here in Miami, there were rumblings that none of the players mm-hmm. dug what he was doing on defense with his football team. Now I'm seeing the same thing from the Philadelphia Eagles. Take a look at their rush defense. It's atrocious. I think yeah. they're allowing, correct me, Andy, like 6.5 yards of carry or something like that. Right, 6.4. You got that, man. Yeah, I mean, that, that's inexcusable uh, for a football team like this. So if they're doing that, they're keeping the other team's offense on the field, which is not good news, uh, you know, obviously, to say the least. And uh, also the defense is out on the field as well. So I think there's a lot of problems going on there with Philadelphia right now. Just my take on these two football teams and the way they come into the contest. Tony Mejia, how do you see this game shaking down here, this big NFL football game, Saints and Eagles? I mean, looking to see if the Saints offensive line is going to be intact. I think that's a huge deal uh, because if they can keep uh, Derek Carr clean, I think they've got a shot. Uh, Carr's obviously played a lot better than most of us expected. Uh, did it with Alvin Kamara, who did not get the contract extension that he wanted and uh, now is, you know, going to I – I don't know if he'll get paid because running backs don't, but he is certainly uh, doing his part to uh, help his agent out over the course of the next few months. Uh, you know, the the thing I think that sticks out to me most about Philly, because we could be talking about a 2-0 and team if uh, Saquon Barkley hauls in a catch that he makes 99 out of 100 times, is that uh, they really have struggled to generate a pass rush when that is probably the strength of that defense. And not probably it is. Uh, and so their bottom five in the league in sack rate, uh, they are not doing anything to help uh, a defensive backfield that we knew was going to struggle, and I think there's going to be some injuries there as well. Uh, yeah, I saw Cooper DeJean it was uh, in the mix at the end uh, in key situations. They played prevent. That certainly doesn't bode well for Fangio. It was way too easy for uh, for the Falcons to drive the ball into scoring range the way they did, and then once you start the pressure at that point, uh, you know, the, you're in, instead of uh, being on the, your own side of the 50, you're already in scoring range. And so I think it was entirely too easy as to uh, how the Falcons took the lead in that game. Uh, but again, it blame to go around Barkley first and foremost. Uh, but beyond his drop, he is, uh, he's pretty much been uh, a really strong uh, performer in that offense. So I think they have to feel good about that. Uh, one concern that I had for them entering the season was how effective uh, that tush push would be considering they rely on it as often as they do. And it appears that that is fine. And that's going to be a weapon going forward. It's wild that you sit there and you decline a penalty the way they did just to take an, uh, an additional 40 seconds off, off the clock, which ironically they ended up not doing because of the Barkley drop, but that you decline that penalty that would have given you a first down because you're so confident in the tush push that it's going to get you a first down. And it did. So, uh, you know, not having Kelsey hurts, uh, a lot on that offensive line, but uh, the push push thing just hasn't come to fruition, which is great for them. Uh, so yeah, look, I, I don't, I, I, um, I become aware of, of, of look ahead lines and all that. I mean, obviously there's look ahead lines every week uh, and lines that are issued over the summer, but I never bet them simply because we don't know what's going to happen in this sport uh, specifically from an injury standpoint that just knocks that all together. So I don't know why you would bet that uh, looking for value in the summer, unless you're clairvoyant. Uh, but as far as the Eagles being a favorite in this game, you know, I, I think it just boils down to do you believe that they are the better team significantly to overcome a short week and a road situation? I haven't made that determination yet, so I am going to abstain on this call, um, but uh, I could see either team winning this game, certainly, and that's a testament to uh, New Orleans because uh, ultimately I would, I would favor Philly despite the short week but the Saints have looked that uh, impressive. And uh, you throw away the Panthers game, certainly, uh, although it, it was uh, good to see them respond in week one, given the state of Dennis Allen and all of that. Uh, but what they were able to do last week to spoil Dallas's home opener, uh, you know, especially given how good the Cowboys looked in Cleveland, uh, I think uh, is eye-opening. It would give me pause in, in wanting to back Philadelphia here. 
Victor, all this interesting fodder in this football game, how does it work, wean into or work up from an over-under standpoint in this game? I'll be interested to see that because there's been a line change, a movement from a favorite to a dog and so forth and whatnot. How do you see this over-under total going? Right. You know, um, Andy mentioned the fact that, yeah, there's only two divisional games scheduled this week in the NFL. But with that said, did you know that half of all games this weekend – will be played indoors in dome stadiums. This is one of those games, eight games being played indoor this wow. week. The, so, I mean, if it, uh, there could be some uh, some shootouts with the fact that the Colts are at home, the Vikings are at home, the Saints are at home, the Raiders, the Cardinals, the Cowboys, the Rams, and the Falcons, all teams at home. A lot of dome games here. Uh, very, very interesting. And, who doesn't want to try and make a case for a high-scoring game down here in the Big Easy? Uh, I know I would like to, that's for sure. And we've even got some uh, juicy situations out of the database in terms of over-under ammunition, like the fact that NFL teams who scored 35 or more in their first two games of the season, like the Saints, in Game 3 they've gone 17-2 and two over-under. Well, 19, ga- 19 situations dating all the way back to the 1994 season. Game three teams who scored 35 or more have gone, I'm wrong on that, 16-2. and two. Still 7-0 and oh to the over last 12 years. Obviously, that favors a high-scoring game on the Saints side of things. We do note that Philadelphia, it's a reduced rest for them. They played at home and lost outright to the Atlanta Falcons. And I've got another one that's even better here out of the database. 17 and 2 to the over for any NFL road dog off a Monday home favorite loss like the Philadelphia Eagles. So we've got the ammunition definitely in our database to indicate a potentially high scoring game. I love the fact that in Mark's uh, coffee club today, he sent out the fact that You've got New Orleans, who is a top three rushing team this season. They're averaging 4.9 yards per rush, taking on this horrific Philadelphia rush defense. Again, give it up 6.4, 6.5, whatever. And when you can run in the NFL, that opens up just about everything else. You can pass. You can do anything you want. Uh, Saints, surprisingly high-scoring numbers, despite the fact that they have emphasized the rush so much. With that said, guys, I think the best play right now in regard to this game, and we're going to hold off on the uh, game over-under, but the play that I did already bet on is the Saints to go over their team total. Their team total is 25.5. I believe Philadelphia is somewhere around 24, 23.5. I don't know if I can trust this Eagle offense to score the 24 or more points that we'll need for the full game to go over. But again, with that said, uh, we're going to hand this to our boy Tuco, our dog Tuco. And since it's down in the Big Easy, he's going to try and grab a cake, uh, a little piece of the uh, king cake and play the Saints <laughs> over 25 and a half. Uh, Saints, 31.8 points per game. Uh, that's their average in the last seven home games. Here's two queries based off that big time start for the Saints. NFL teams who scored 40 or more in back-to-back games have averaged 30.9 points per game since the 2012 season. That applies to the Saints. Uh, Another one, NFL Game 3 teams, like I just mentioned, who scored 35 or more, have averaged 34.1 points per game since 2011. I got a couple of tidbits. It's been a high-scoring series between these two teams. Uh, Seven and three to the over last ten meetings. The last four games played in the Big Easy, the Eagles have given up 31.5 points per game. So I think the better play right now is to play against that horrific right now Philadelphia defense and sharp Saint offense. And that's the one that we'll bet right now is the Saints to go over their team total of 25.5. Victor fades that terrible Philadelphia rush defense and goes over the total, the team total with New Orleans in the football game. Greg DePalma. How do you see this game shaking out? And I know uh, it was nice Victor alluded to the coffee club, and uh, I know we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things that we share in the coffee club each and every week. 
How do you see this game, Victor, Sunday between New Orleans and Philadelphia? Greg. I'm sorry, Greg. Yeah, well, uh, this is one that, as you know, when we were doing our, our preseason picks, I, I just really didn't have a good feeling about the NFC East. And uh, sure, it didn't look like that was the case week one. But again, it's early, just like it's early in week two. It's just real early. Uh, so I'm not going to make any judgments on the entire season after one or two weeks. But um, I just bring it up because I just didn't have any faith in the Eagles and thought that uh, if they if they have issues early in the season with the whole situation with their coach, just felt that that was going to really hurt their chances. And um, and 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 this is uh, this is this is why this might be the game of the year for them because if they lose this one after the way they lost the, the, the last one, it could snowball. Uh, so it's a huge game, but that doesn't mean I like them because of it. Uh, I just think that, like you say, Mark, and, 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 I, and I wasn't sure, of course, what the historical trends were in Game 3, but I'm glad that they're siding with the Saints because I like the Saints in this one just because how can you not, based on how they've looked so far the first two weeks. Sometimes coaches are lucky because there's some stability there. Uh, obviously, whatever Clint Kubiak is doing is just remarkable. and uh, But that's, that's what happens in the NFL. We saw it last year with Slowick and Stroud. Sometimes you get the right coordinator who hasn't made a name for himself yet, and he goes somewhere and he finds the right quarterback and a mesh, and that's what's going on right now. And I had, and I just find it really hard to go against the Saints in this spot. So, um, so I was all over the Saints in this one anyway. But then I looked at once again the Playbook magazine, <laughs> and there are three uh, trends working really against the Eagles here. Uh, one is one in ten against the spread one is one in nine against the spread and the one that's one in 12 against the spread is uh it, when 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 uh they're off a straight up loss taking on an nfc opponent off a upset win one in 12 and then on the flip side the saints are 11 and one against the spread versus non-division favorites which of course that's now switched over to the to 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 the Saints. I mean, so as a favorite, so that doesn't work. Um, but all of those uh, trends were still siding with the Eagles, um, and it was something that we talked about on the uh, as a closeout. Uh, Andy and I do the Predict the Lines show on the Our Lads Football Network. We just recorded it, and this was a game that we were talking about. So I, I'd like your opinion uh, on on the whole idea of, you know. With the Eagles being the two and a half point favorite on on Monday going into the evening, and then you like the Saints uh, as it is, um, th- that's a tricky situation because then all of a sudden you wake up the next day and, and you didn't take advantage of it on on Monday before the game uh, because you went you basically lost five points if if you think about it going from two and a half to two and a half in one night. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if you have any advice for anybody out there as far as because that's really early in the week line wagering, as a uh, even though that's what you guys do for the uh, Wise Guy contests. They got to be in at twelve o'clock on Tuesdays. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I don't know if you're asking me or Andy for that question, Greg. But oh, uh, you. I mean, I already know okay. Andy's answer. That's fine. You can find that out on the Arlet Show. Okay, good. <laughs> uh, you know, as far as games like this are concerned, uh, they're a little bit difficult to, to gauge because. You can handicap a game and really like it, and you're just waiting, anticipating for this game to come out, what you think the number is going to be. You see the dog. You're going to go all in on the game. All of a sudden, they're favored. Now, what do I do? Well, it reminds me of an axiom that I was told, that you don't play the football game because there's always another game coming up next, uh, rather than chasing bad value in a situation like that. So if you liked the Saints because they were the dog and now they're the favorite, let the game go. Wait till another situation arises in a case like this. Now, there's also the Jim Feist theory in this football game. And what I'm going to call the Jim Feist theory is simply that Jim will play on any home favorite of less than three points on a money line. That way he's not coughing up or giving up points. He's feeling at least he's got a team. If they win the game, he'll cash the ticket. going to be a little bit of juice involved in a play like that. But I'm sure if Jim Feist did like, in this football game, the New Orleans Saints, and he didn't play it when they were the dog and is out there now, he would most likely play it on a money line in a pick type situation. So a lot of thought to a situation like that. And that's a great question, Greg. All right. Well, that's my input. I'm going with the Saints either way. I know I lost value, but I'm still going to go ahead and take them either way. But by the way, I did not lose value on the Wise Guy contest. They were still a two-and-a-half-point dog. 
Yeah, but that's yeah, because those games right. are <laughs> static. They're frozen when they come out. Exactly yeah. right. So, so yep. yep, exactly right. By the way, that didn't work to my advantage last year. I remember when uh, it was early in the season and it was the Cleveland San Francisco game, and uh, remember the the line had changed because of the injuries, and, and but the wise guy line uh, was w- was in early. So, um, and I forget exactly how it worked out, but it was like, uh, I think if you took San Francisco, you were now, uh, I think you were, again, I think it was either one way or the other. I just don't remember, but I, I think you guys know what I'm talking about. And, um, but the thing was, was that even though you felt you were taking advantage, which you were, you act, I actually lost it, e- even though I lost that game anyway, even though I was getting like uh, an advantage. And I think it was because maybe the line had shrunk or something. So I was, I was not even getting, I didn't have to give many points up for San Francisco in the game. And it wound up being a, an advantage for me. And yet they lost anyway. So sometimes, it, no matter what, you, sometimes you get the advantage and it doesn't even help you. Yeah, the Browns won that game 19-17. to 17. The final line was somewhere around nine or nine and a half. Okay. They were home dogs of that high. And I believe it was because of the quarterback change that the Niners went into such a big favorite territory in that game. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. Okay, guys, uh, before we get to our next segment, I want to remind everybody to make sure, if you haven't done so yet, to order your copy now of the 2024 Playbook Totals Tip Sheet Newsletter. I mentioned before, winning seasons in 14 of the last 17 years, coming off a nice winning best bet week. Last week, the totals tip sheet, 72, 38, and 6 the previous five years on best bets. Subscribe now to the totals tip sheet online at playbooksports.com. And just all of the numbers you hear from Victor are almost all in the totals tip sheet. You can pick it up and get a head start on your man this weekend. That's a totals tip sheet at playbooksports.com. Now, we're going to go to a new segment on the show this week, and we're going to call it the Playbook High Five. And what we're going to do is to ask each of our analysts, each of our experts, they get less than a minute. Greg's going to have the stopwatch out there, and they have less than a minute to provide a featured game of the week uh, on the card this particular week. Uh, you're not going to have a lot of long chance to get into the reasons why and the so forths and the whatnots, but I know our listeners would love to know what you have for your featured game of the week. And, Andy, it's a task now, less than one minute. I'm going to put it on you. Who's your featured game of the week? I'm going to go to the game between Western Kentucky and Toledo. Toledo off one of the biggest wins in program history, and it was a legitimate win. In fact, you could call a spanking that they did at Mississippi State last week, and now they're uh, on the road to a very good Western Kentucky uh, program that's been a solid uh, team in the uh, Conference USA for Oh, the last, the better part of the last decade. And they're also coming off of a nice win, but not quite as impressive as that Middle Tennessee State, although it was a convincing win. You know, Toledo, and again, I'll go back to Mark Lawrence. I'll go back to your playbook preview. Toledo, returning four offensive starters, four defensive starters, returning production 122, which is 127 offense, 103 defense. They lost a lot of talent from last year's team, and yet they've gotten off to a solid start. But to me, this is a classic uh, letdown situation. Toledo, especially with their game coming up, and I believe it's in two weeks, they have next week off against Miami of Ohio at home, the team that knocked them off on that same field last year in the MAC championship game. Uh, they made Toledo a small two, two and a half point favorite. I'm on board with Western Kentucky. Oh, Greg, did, did almost. He, Greg, did, did he get it in? <laughs> you, you missed it by about three seconds. But oh, I, can, I can edit that out. Don't worry cool. about it. Good, good job, Andy. Nice job, Andy. Very nice job. <laughs> Victor I King. Did, I did it so that no one could criticize the pick. <laughs> <laughs> because if we go 40 seconds everybody got 20 seconds to you know time chime in there yeah to, to, to take some pot shots there i hear either you. that either that or i was just lucky yeah. victor king your game of the week you're on the clock for 60 seconds our game of the week is a first half totals game of the week and it's going to be houston minnesota under 22 and a half points in the first half i love what brian flores is doing with that underrated Vikings defense. They're playing like the hair's on fire, the Vikings. Ben, ben, but don't break style. They held the Niners to only 17 points at home last week, despite surrendering 399 yards. Again, I love what Flores are doing. Both of these teams were ranked in the top four when it came to first half unders last season. The top two teams were Jacksonville and Minnesota at 5-12 and 12 over under in the first half. Then at three and four, it was Carolina and Houston at six and 11 over under in the first half, breaking down the Houston numbers. Yeah, they went six and three in the first half to the over at home, 
but a perfect 0 and 9 to the under in their road games in the first half. Houston Texans, in addition, the host Vikings, they're one of only seven teams that has started the current season with an 0 and 2 over under record in the first half. Houston and Minnesota under 22 and a half in the first half of their game. Victor wow. goes under the total for his 60-second best bet. Greg, did we check that box? That was about 72 seconds. Oh, 70, shit. 72. <laughs> you got some work to do, Greg. <laughs> yeah, more editing. Cool. Tony Mejia, you're on the clock. Your best bet of the week. All right, let's go to the DFW area for the uh, Battle of the Iron Skillet. And it's TCU at SMU, Gerald Ford Stadium. And we like the Horned Frogs, uh, who UCF beat last week. Uh, edged them 35-34, so looking for TCU to bounce back. Certainly a rivalry game will allow you to do that better than most. SMU's benched quarterback Preston Stone, who's a highly touted kid from that area in favor of sophomore Kevin Jennings. More of a rushing threat, but they're doing that because their offensive line stinks. Uh, so give me the team that can pass it better. Josh Hoover's off to a really nice start, has uh, two great receivers, among others, because they, they go out four deep there. Uh, Savion Williams, who's a 6'5", a red zone target. He's got a, at least three touchdowns this season. Uh, Jack Beck, who's uh, had a 200-yard game this year. Uh, Rhett Lashley has struggled this season. SMU was uh, expected to do a lot better than they have. Give me TCU, either laying the two and a half, or I prefer on the money line. That way you're not messing around, uh, pushing if you lay three and the line moves there. So TCU on the money line, minus 145 to win on the road at SMU. I think Tony had a winner there, Greg. Am I right? He actually did until he just kind of kept going and going. Yeah, so <laughs> you, you, were at, you, were almost, you were at 70 seconds. But you could have you could have stopped it, but you just you know you added some additional information. The people need their information. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I would have been a long shot to have been the shortest. Oh, so absolutely, Mark, Mark and Greg, you got You got to beat the sixty-two seconds. <laughs> well, oh, so I'm, far, not the 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 I'm not a part of this. I'm not a part. These these are for you guys. The, the, Mark's Mark's the last one up. So Mark, hi right, Greg, you're gonna put yourself on the clock. Don't fudge in the clock. Who do you like for your best? Oh, you're gonna let me do this. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. I'll try to do this. I, I'm not ready, but I'll go ahead and I have a, I have a pick. Let's see. I did the um, uh, what's I want to see which game. By the way, before I even pick the game, um, I just wanted to uh, ask you about that situation, Tony, the TCU quarterback situation because uh, the SMU quarterback situation because Andy and I talked about it on the other uh, show um, because I thought it was interesting uh, that Jennings actually is a team captain and represented SMU at media day, even though he wasn't the starting quarterback going into the season. So they love this guy. Uh, and I hear what you're right. saying as far as the offensive line and such, but it's almost like, I think this is the problem, in my opinion, I think what happens to coaches sometimes is that they get too close, too personally close to specific players, especially at the quarterback position. And you like a guy so much, and he's such a great guy and he's a team leader, that even though he's not as talented as the other guy, you just, you know, you kind of want the other guy to start. Yeah, look, I, I do not know what the dynamic is, and certainly Jennings could be a better leader. Stone certainly has struggled. He's missed throws. He was a kid that once you got him, you expected him to be a four-year starter. And then Jennings uh, performed well in the bowl game uh, because I think Stone was injured, and now Jennings had a, a ton of momentum going into the season, as you mentioned rep them at uh, Big 12 Media Day, and then all of a sudden, when they were struggling at Nevada, he was in there pretty quickly, and uh, he is their starter. So uh, not they say that Stone is handling it well, and uh, we'll see if he continues to be part of that team in, in a large uh, way, but I expect him to transfer at the season, season's end. Because certainly he, oh, yeah. he could have gone anywhere. Yeah, he could have gone anywhere and uh, stuck it out, wanted to be at SMU. And uh, doesn't sound like SMU wants him. That, that's reciprocated now. And that's the great thing. That's what I love about the transfer portal. I mean, there's a lot of bad things about it, but this is what I love about it because now, now you have Ken Jennings will start here and Stone will start there. So that's that's good for us as fans. So you, what, one quick thing about that that and to prove that I did not put all my notes in that uh, little one minute blurb, but it surprised me. TCU has been favored 24 consecutive times in that series, which I guess you throw in a lot of the uh, death penalty stuff for SMU, but that's 
that's still wild for a rivalry. Yeah, and the other thing I, I noticed is that uh, it's really all about Sonny Dykes. Because Sonny Dykes, if you, if you take his last two years at SMU and his first two years at TCU, he's won them all as the head coach. He's won as the two, yeah, really. he was, he's won as the dog two years at SMU, and he's won as the favorite two years with TCU. <laughs> so he's the man right now in the series. Yep. So. Yep. All right, I'm going to go ahead and uh, time myself here. Greg, are you ready, or would you like me to go now, or would you want more time? No, I'm ready to go. Okay, then you're on the clock, Greg. Okay, here we go. I'm going to talk about a game that I think you're going to reference, or you referenced earlier on, Mark. Uh, That is the San Jose State-Washington State game that's coming up on Friday night. And this is a game where uh, you might see Washington State in an Apple Cup hangover. Uh, The fact that they played the Apple Cup last week, they've got the sandwich game with Boise State next week, uh, throw in the fact that San Jose State is playing probably better than a lot of people thought that they were going to play. Uh, and I'm going to go back to the Playbook uh, magazine, the publication, uh, my trusted source. Uh, San Jose State is 15-2-1 and one against the spread in regular season games off a double-digit ATS win. Again, 15-2-1. and one. one and no in that spot this year. 16-6-1 and one against the spread as a road dog since 2018. One or no in that spot this year. And to wrap it all up, the quarterback for San Jose State is a Washington State transfer. Quarterback Emmett Brown. You know he's going to want to stick it to his former team. So I'm taking San Jose State as a 14-point dog and might actually dangle with the 5-1 to one money line play. You dog, Greg De Palma. That's the game I was going to use. Okay. Oh, okay. You did it. You did it. You got it. You claimed it. It's yours. Okay. Okay. I'm, I'm sorry I'm about really that. You know, if this kid Emmett Brown is named after the Back to the Future guy, that's, Back to the Future. That is, that is my uh, Doc Brown. What I need to know. That's awesome. There you go. All right, guys. I'll go to one uh, B here for my play this week and uh i'm going to go inside the big 12 conference and look at byu when they host kansas state this particular weekend we all know how good chris Kleiman has been as a head coach at kansas state 37 and 22 to the spread but he's only human on the road just 12 and 11 and three and seven against a 700 or better opponent he's also got a big revenge game up on deck next week against oklahoma state they're going to journey into byu we've gotten off to this great start this year and in fact they are 3-0 and straight up against the spread and in the stats. BYU has won the stats an average of 200 yards a game. Yet they're the home dog in this particular football game. Go back. If you look at them as a dog, 18-5 and is a dog of late. 11-1 and the last 12 games, the dog for BYU. Give me the Cougars plus the points. Mark's the man. Right on the money. No, actually, he had 15 seconds left. I had 15 seconds to spare. Good. Yeah, 45 <laughs> All right, seconds. Thanks. I bet the under. Thanks, Mark. <laughs> yeah, Does that un- carry over to the next week so he gets uh, uh, I got it. Doesn't 15 seconds splash. Yes, yeah. I do. <laughs> YouTube won't let, it, won't let us work that way. But it anyway, it, those it are our happen. shorts. So that'll work. All right, Greg, I'm going to let you wrap up the show here with the final uh, new segment on the thing. We're going to call it Viewer's Feedback. And Greg's going to go over some of the top coffee club notes from last week to help the in, our listeners and viewers out there to let them know what the coffee club is all about. Greg, take it away, if you will. Yeah, I'm going to go through. Now, since it's the first time we're doing this, uh, I want to, uh, I'm going to go back a, a little ways, uh, but starting next week, I'm going to, now I'm getting caught up. I'm going to, it'll be on a week to week deal. Uh, Cause I got one that I saved uh, quite a while ago. And this is from William S from Jersey city, New Jersey, uh, which is actually where I was born. So uh, William S. from Jersey City, New Jersey, dropped this note. Yesterday was Christmas in July. The Mark Lawrence 2024 Playbook Football Preview Magazine was delivered. I am deeply immersed in all your wisdom in print. Thank you, Mark. Longtime Playbook subscriber and admirer. Awesome. And we're deeply pleased that he dropped us that note with all those kind words. Thank you very much. Uh, also, uh, I figured this would be a good time because at some point I wanted to do this and I just take advantage of the or, or take a look back at the odds that were released. And this is this was, again, probably, I believe, like in July, you might be you might uh, remember, uh, Mark, this was the uh, uh, odds released by betonline.ag for the first coach to be fired this season in college football. And uh, Billy Napier was leading the pack uh, at four to one odds. And um, you also mentioned that da- Dabo Sweeney. Uh, was on the list of 25 to 1. Uh, and so the way they've looked over the last couple of weeks, that's not happening. 
So Napier four to one, Sam Pittman five to one, Mario Cristobal six to one. No oh, way. What? Uh, that's not happening. Yeah. So what about, actually, what about uh, Novell? Actually, you know what? I'm going to go ahead and go Novell, through them, yeah. and then each of you can say yes or no. All right, Billy Napier four to one. No. No even what? money. Oh well, I, I will say he might not survive if they lose at Mississippi State. Right. I make okay. him I'll even money. That he right. doesn't survive when they win at Mississippi State because they have a, a, the perfect situation to fire him already. They the trustees have met. And uh, it's a bye week, so I think this is a swan song. Hopefully, he goes Has out with it a win. B U Y buy out the contract? <laughs> that kind of bye week. Next one. Uh, the the bye week, and then the the bye week for the interim <laughs> guy yeah. to, to prepare for UCF uh, to, to begin October. And here's an interesting thing because I'm already looking ahead here, and a lot of these guys are all off to good starts. Uh, next, Sam Pittman, five to one. No way. No way. Again, off to a good I, start, Greg. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they're waiting for this season to end and come to UNLV and get their former defensive coordinator, Barry Odom. Well, the way Pittman's coaching so far, though, and, he, and uh, you know, that what a great, again, what a great situation to, to, for them to grab the, uh, that uh, tail of green from Boise State in the portal. I and mean, what big game for them against this week, Greg. Oh, yeah. yeah, absolutely. So that's why uh, if they win that game, Arkansas is off and running. What were you saying, Tony? It's a big game for them against Auburn. Yeah. Uh, all right. Here's the next one. Mario Cristobal, six to one. And he ain't getting fired. He might even get nope. an extension if he keeps this up. Uh, even though uh, he's already. Unless he turns money. this into a six and seven season and doesn't make a bowl or six and six season, which he's been known to do. That is true. <laughs> yes. uh, next up, even though it's quietly, I think he's having a good season so far, and this week's going to be a big indication of that. Dave Aranda, Baylor, seven to one. Many people thought he wasn't week. going to be back this year, even. Right. So, you know, I think he's scratching and clawing right now with the Bears, and I think the Bears will end up win- making a bowl game and saving his tide, is what I think personally. Yeah, and they have. I the- think he's a- Go ahead. What was that, Tony? No, I, I think he's he's better suited to be a defensive coordinator than a head coach. And yep. uh, da- Daquan Finn, the, the Toledo transfer, who was expected to be their number one. He's fighting injury issues, so they're, they're going at it with a backup quarterback. Now. Although he played well the other the last week. Yeah, and keep in mind uh, that, and we talked about this, Mark and I, in the beginning of the season, that um, Aranda smartly took over the defensive coordinator role for the team. I mean, why not? I mean, you're one of the best defensive coordinators in college football, and you just decide, well, I'm going to be a head coach now. Baylor didn't hire him because of his head coaching prowess. They hired him because he was a genius defensive coordinator. And so now I, – I, Go ahead, Tony. Go ahead. No, I, said, I, I blamed last year on Jeff Grimes, who I, I thought butchered that offense, uh, and now Grimes is really struggling with Kansas. So, I mean, if, if Baylor can turn things around and Aranda can make him hit the fall guy too. Oh, and by the way, here's one from the Playbook magazine. Baylor 13 and 1 against the spread off a non-conference versus a conference game. And they're 1 and 0 in that spot this year, and they're a 2-point dog at Colorado. All right, next up, here's another good one. Clark Lee Vanderbilt 8 to 1. To be fired? Yes. Or to get a promotion? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'd say it's more the latter, Andy. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Uh, Kalani Satake, BYU, 10 to 1. 3 and 0. Are you kidding me? Come on. Ryan Day, Ohio State. I guess we got to wait till the Michigan game. 12 to 1. <laughs> Greg, are these all before the season began? Yes. Or? Yeah. Oh, this, yeah. Well, that, yep. It's making sense now because they right. certainly wouldn't be in the conversation right now as we're speaking. Yeah. Right. That's why I wasn't sure when, when it was because I didn't have the date here, but it might have been pretty – might have been like uh, early August, late July. Well, the, the thing that's interesting, I'll go back to Arkansas for, so for a moment because their offensive coordinator, Bobby Petrino, uh, has had a head coaching experience, including at Arkansas where it didn't turn out very well with some indiscretions. <laughs> and uh, Ryan Day has uh, Chip Kelly there to uh, succeed him if indeed uh, – Ohio State struggles, which I think is very unlikely, but uh, the situation is set up there. I actually, I'll, I'll, out of all the guys you mentioned there, I would say Ryan Day would be my choice to be most in trouble. And uh, so we'll talk after the the stretch that's at Oregon, home to Nebraska, at Penn State. They lose two of those games. Ohio State uh, fans will not be happy. Yeah, because they're playing high schools right now, as you know, Tony. So, exactly. Yeah. 
And by yeah. the way, Ryan Day, if he has a really good season and they win the national championship, he could get a head coaching job in the NFL too. So yeah, that's-, that's how crazy it is. All right, next one. Justin Wilcox, 12-1, to 1, California. No, not another, they've had a great start. Yes. Another one for an extension. Right. Yep. 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 Here we go again. I mean, back, back-to-back games against Auburn, losing 14-10 on the road, and then the uh, the win the other day, the outright win at Auburn. That alone is enough to get him an extension for that program. Next up, 12-1, to 1, Pat Narduzzi. Nope, you can you can take him off the list too. I mean, they, that was a big win against West Virginia. Right. Panthers have gotten off to a really nice start here so far this football season. Here, Narduzzi will be in Pittsburgh for a few more years. Yeah, and, yeah, and, and West Virginia. On a related note, West Virginia fans are done with Neil Brown after blowing a uh, ten-point lead with five minutes to go. Well, yep. Narduzzi. By the way, the next coach on the list is Neil Brown. Well, that may be the oh, adios. That, that synergy. Tony signals at the adios. That I might, would think they have to make a bowl game this year, and even that might not be enough. And that was a really uh, – by the way, Pittsburgh had two come-from-behind wins in a row. Like Cincinnati on the road and then a home against West Virginia. So they've had a really great start. Uh, Scott Satterfield, Cincinnati, 14-1. to Yeah, he's okay so far, right? So far. Yeah, yeah remember, it's, uh, they were dominant in the AAC before they made the move last well, – was last year, I think, to the uh, Big 12. It'll yep. take a couple of recruiting classes to uh, get up to – just a few more and another guy that's off to a good start could be undefeated shane beamer south carolina 16 to 1 he's gonna have to win though greg i mean you know i know he's had played some pretty close football close calls and things like that but it's all about winning in the sec unless you're at vanderbilt you know yeah. where it's all about uh making sure that uh you win the highest grade per uh student athlete uh for grades there, but he's going to have to win. I think a Beamer is, I'm not saying he's in the hot seat. He's played some pretty good football now, but if they end up with a losing season, he'll be fresh in the, in the talk for sure. Yeah. It's been a strange season. They struggled against old dominion as a heavy favorite. Uh, then they had the big, uh, upset win at Kentucky. And then it looks like that they're going to beat up all over LSU. And then they lose the game in the final seconds. And uh, now they got to face the powerhouse Akron. <laughs> yeah, well. we'll live up to their nickname, the Zips. The yeah. Zips. <laughs> uh, Tony Elliott, Virginia, sixteen to one. He's looking good. So Calandria well, stepped up a QB, so that helps. He's only yep. a sophomore. Uh, yep. Mike Loxley at Maryland. Uh, that one could be interesting. Uh, we've got to keep an eye on Maryland this year. And then he, met- he's probably done overall a better job at Maryland than a lot of people. Absolutely. From the yep. outside, yep. would have, cons- would yes. have thought possible. And for the neighborhood that he lives in, Andy, for sure. And by the way, the whole reason for that is is because one thing and one thing only, he recruits. He's not a very good head coach. He's just a really good recruiter. That's all. Who's that? Who's it? Uh, Loxley. Loxley. Mike Loxley. Loxley. Yeah. I got you. That's actually how he got the job because uh, he did nothing. What was that? What did he have, the New Mexico job, I believe? New Mexico or, or state, one or the other. I don't yeah. remember one of the two. Yeah, right? New and he was awful. And then he got, he, he got rejuvenated at Alabama. As, the, as yep. an assistant. So, uh, Swinney, and then the last one on the list, and it might as well bring him up, the last on the list, because all most of these guys are looking really good, is Lincoln Riley at 25 to 1. So, uh, we'll know a little bit more this weekend. They're favored on the right. road at the, the road. Yeah, I think we'll know by the end of the season. Uh, you know, if this football team struggles in the Big Ten Conference, uh, there may not be any excuses left for him with Caleb Williams being gone, and uh, he's going to have to win. He's making a big, big dollar there in uh, Los Angeles right well, how now. How about uh, Venables at uh, Oklahoma? Yeah, David. Yeah, I, was, I was just about to say, if, like, I, I would make a, a wager with somebody that that wants it because you probably have to give me odds. But I bet uh, Lincoln Riley outlasts Brent Venables at their current location. And how I about the one uh, that I think Tony uh, that. Uh, uh, Vic brought up uh, Norvell at uh, Florida State. FSU, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's you know, I mean, that's a tricky one because, you know, he, he had the pressure going into last season, and then they almost go on their way to a national championship season. Everybody thinks they're going to be great again. It's not his fault that everybody thinks he's gonna, they're going to be great again. He lost so much talent. Uh, yeah, what if he loses again this week, Greg? And he very well might. But if he lost so much talent, doesn't that – say something about the recruiting that he has either himself or his assistants and i guess you're supposed to you're supposed to reload at florida state not restock yeah i agree with that 
Um, so we'll see. You might guys might be right. If he doesn't have a great season, maybe they'll just say, oh, well, what doesn't matter? By the way, Lincoln Riley, 2-7 and seven against the spread as a road favorite. Uh, so that's a tough one at Michigan, even though, I, you know, I think they're clearly a better team in Michigan. Now, does that include his, uh, his time at the Oklahoma or just with USC? Uh, Lincoln Riley. That, I'm sure. that I'm one sure. is... It's Oklahoma also, I think. It is Oklahoma? Okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah, all time. But I would think they'd be road favorites. In oh, actually, places. no. It says here, like I have Lincoln Riley with USC two and seven against his okay. road favorite. Yeah, that yeah would because be he was the road favorite a lot at Oklahoma. Yeah, yeah. that's probably true there. Yeah. All right, and then uh, uh, let's now go to the comments, um, the the uh, viewer comments, and again, there's some that we just, just have not gotten to for a while. So let's uh, go through this. Uh, Band Bando SWB 33, uh, 3378. There is so much gambling content, but your show is the one I always listen to week in and week out. Keep up the good work. Next, My man Bando, good. Bando. Next up is Rick White. I don't believe he is the wide receiver at UNLV. Uh, 3112 is, uh, let's see. Oh, actually, this let's was... Hope a- not. Yeah, th- this was actually a question he wanted to know, and we didn't, we never answered it for him. Is the Pac-12 still considered to be in the Power Five with only two teams left? So I believe not. No. No, we call it the Power Four now. Yes, we do. Av, A-V-E, the Prophet. A-V-E, the Prophet 83. Love the content, family. Mr. La- Love the content, family. Mr. Lawrence, keep it coming. Love the content, family. Uh, next up. While uh, Will Hildebrand, thirteen thirteen, Will Hildebrand, great stuff, guys. Four Hall of Famers, and that inc- and and that does not include Mark Lawrence and Jim Feist. Uh, I was just that was me adding the uh, <laughs> no great stuff, guys. Four Hall of Famers, the producer, that's me, and Mejia. Best chance for a last place that's division nice. team to win division this year to me is the Bengals. So, oh, last the first, yeah, yeah. And, and that's probably still the case, guys, because they, how many they times have they started 0-2? And, and, and they were last place last. Yeah, well, they, I think, what's the number now? Like 314-1 and one in his first uh, uh, five, three games of the season. But they were they were a fourth-place team, last place last year with a 9-8 and eight record. Uh, let's, and an injured quarterback for much of the year. Next up, uh, let's see. Where is this? Um, okay, here we go. Uh, Terry Hill, 859. Uh, do the RPR updates during the season and what other stats that should stay prevy on that? Let's see. I, can, I don't know if I can. That's, I'm glad you said that, Greg, because we have not updated the current RPR numbers on the website. Oh, okay. I'll be making a point to do that. Anybody's interested and you follow our RPR numbers in the Playbook Preview Guide magazine. Those are Bill Conley's returning production rankings. He put a final tweak on those just before the season began. They differentiate just a little bit from those in the magazine. But the final ones we will have up on the website. Just log on at playbooksports.com forward slash RPR. By the way, on that same subject, and I'd like to get everyone else's comments. At what point do you not really relate to the RPR or the returning starters? I normally say four games or the end of September. You give them, they're nice to look back at to explain some things. But as far as going forward, by the time you've played four or five games at the end of September, you're pretty much this year's team. Well, that's a great question, Andy. And I think uh, digging deeper into the question is the fact that the top three or four teams in the RPR rankings have done extremely well from the beginning of the season to the end of the season. So I think what you want to do is you want to keep a track on who the top three or four teams were, how they're doing against the spread now. And if they're doing well now, there's no sense in getting off of them because they built this camaraderie and they have this momentum going, talking about Iowa State, I believe Stanford was on that list, I believe number two. Uh, but, you know, you certainly don't want to jump off the Iowa State Cyclone at this point for sure. Yeah, no, I was thinking in terms of probably two-thirds of those who are below the teams that have, let's say, a minimum of uh, eight returning starters on each side of the ball, which I think would, would, would turn to balance as well as a lot of experience. And because at that point, the ones who were not starters last year are getting the experience uh, for those teams that don't have the huge amount of returning starters at, at, at that point. In other words, I, and I'm just going to take an example. You know, at, you know, at this time of the year or like in another two weeks, the San Jose State's returning starters add that much to the handicap as we approach the half a point of the season. 
uh, a lot of the returning starters, and that and that's that's where depth, that's where the SEC comes in because they always they don't always return a lot of returning starters per se, but the backups that they have are as good as the, in many cases the backups that have that the starters that have just left. You, you know what we're going to start handicapping here sooner than later, Andy is maybe not so much returning starters and maybe not so much returning production or maybe even uh, maybe even. Uh, the transfer portal, but how much money teams are spending on players. You, know, you heard about Tennessee, didn't you? They're no, now well, they're going to institute a 10% additional fee for ticket prices, calling it a talent fee. A talent fee. <laughs> they announced that, I think, yesterday, that next year it's going to include that. And, and that, believe me, that's just the first to start. Well, hey, wait till they get that the share in the revenue? Drop their touchdown pass and see what the, how the crowd reacts. <laughs> yeah. yeah, right. Hopefully they get the share in their revenue if they yeah. uh, make a lot of money that yeah. season. I don't think so. By the, oh, by the way, Iowa State, I just want to throw this out there. I was the only one uh, so far to put Iowa State in our college football, the Our Lads College Football Poll. And I'm not saying that to uh, say anything other than to use it as a way for me to say, Andy, man, you don't – I couldn't even believe it when I went through your poll. I was like, I haven't noticed this. You know what I'm going to say, right, as far as your college football poll? What, the Notre Dame's back in? No. Iowa State's where they're at? No, he doesn't oh, even have Iowa, Iowa State. What's that? He doesn't even have Iowa State, Andy. Yeah, I'm not sold on them. That's not yeah. That's not it. Wow, I can't believe you just – has this like completely gone over your head? Maybe not. You don't even have Texas in your college football poll. I thought I put him in. I thought I moved – unless I – No, you've not before. had them in the entire season. I had him in this – I had him – no, I think I had him this week like six or something. It, what was that? I no. may not have had him at the start of the season. Well, maybe the first week. Yeah. So, yeah. So, any particular reason why you don't believe in them? Uh, I want to see how they play in the SEC. They're okay. stepping up in class. Fair enough. Although, to be fair, they've done very well in their limited games against Alabama the last few years. All right. Now, a few more to go uh, as far as comments. By the way, back to Will Hildebrand, 1313. Had to give this a like. Blows my mind how people will listen to others with no track record. Probably 150 plus years of betting experience here. Great information. Two thumbs up, Will. Nice comment. Thank you. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a dig at uh, you, Mark, you, me, and Jim. 150 years of experience because it's because it's actually correct <laughs> yeah. uh clay perry k-y-n-b-k hi i just finished reading betting football to win by mike winsmore and he spoke very highly of you can i get a copy of your playbook pdf thank you so i'm well, sure let you've me already you given this. him i'll, right? I'll give you an, in, an insider's take on that comment there okay that book that he mentioned was NFL Week One Winners, and it's a terrific book. It's been published for like four years in a row. I don't think it was this year. The author of that book was Mike Maines, the author of the NFL Football Preview for 10 years in the Playbook Football Preview Guide magazine. He knoweth what he speaketh. Mike knows the NFL like the back of his hand, so I was not surprised at all to see how good that NFL Week One Winners book ended up being. And that's a high compliment. Yes. You and I both know Mike. Yes. That's great work. All right. Next up, another uh, repeat. Uh, AVE, The Prophet 83. Man, y'all are the best content and smooth personalities. That's AVE, The Prophet 83. HB Glass. Love the show, gentlemen. The stats are great. Wondering if you guys can go over the strategies of Survivor Pool. Mm, Thank you. There we go. So. For the few people that are left. For those of us that are left, yeah. Yeah. Well, well I'll, I'll give you one quick story here, guys. Uh, first week of the season, I'm, in, I'm partnering with a guy, and we're in a major, major Survivor contest. Not the one at the Circa, but even bigger than that. And, you know, right away, out of the gate, he wants to use Baltimore. And I said, no way in the world are we going to use the most popular favorite the first week out of the gate. Because when they lose the Baltimore pool. Baltimore or Cincinnati. Or the pool's going to dump, right? No, I was going to say you, Cincinnati was the big favorite week one. So we got by. We used Buffalo. We scratched and clawed and won. Week number two, what happens last week? Number one think- favorite. He submits it. He uses it, and we lose. It's it, it's it's like a lesson to be learned. I don't Baltimore Ravens, by the way, that was okay. You know, I think the strategy in Survivor pools is bottom line to me. Do not use the number one favorite right. until until you're in a position where the pool's down to nothing and it's manageable at that point. But when you're up against a, 
uh, a stadium full of c competition. You can't do that. You have to let them beat themselves. That's my. No, no, in, in Victor, certain, you're in a uh, lot of survivor pools. Uh, what's, your, just, what's your take on that? Yeah, I, I got into three. I'm out in two of them. I'm still alive in one, uh, the big money one, which I'm thankful for, uh, definitely. But this, look at the stats in the NFL. The six point or higher dogs in the NFL are a perfect eight and no ATS to the point spread this season. Not only that, but seven point or more dogs, not only are they a perfect ATS, but they're a perfect three and O oh straight up. Seven point or more underdogs. Wow. It's been a fantastic gonna... season for the long dogs in the NFL. So Mark, you said it. You hit it right on the head. Get away from that number one favorite of the week, please. I was going to mention that in the circa, there was a little different reason for not choosing Baltimore last week, and that's because I, I'm guessing that your contest goes the 18 weeks. You don't have the little uh, gimmick in there for the uh, Thanksgiving split the week. Thanksgiving and the Thanksgiving day, no, week yeah, right. Because Baltimore is one of the six teams that plays on that short Christmas week. And Christmas week this year, I believe, is week 17 of the NFL because I think the final week is the one that covered like New Year's Day. So, so there they're, was a a saver team. they're a saver team then, right? right. They're, they're a saver team. Now, I actually went against that because I played Houston, who I believe Baltimore plays in that Christmas game. But I felt it was a good spot to play Houston because they're getting Chicago at Chicago's weakest point of the season. Chicago, I think, is going to be one of those teams that shows gradual improvement. Of course, it may have to be more than gradual now, but that's another uh, thing. And we had over 2,300 people. I think there are now 3,887 out of a field of 14,266 in Survivor, meaning a $14.266 million payday. The imputed value, uh, meaning that if everybody went perfect and you split up the $14.266 million, your $1,000 entry right now is worth about $3,600, $3,700. Nice. Uh, but by you're not going to cash that in. <laughs> as the, the seven or more uh, dogs this week are the Giants, Carolina, the Rams, and Washington. So if you want to keep that going. All right. Next up, uh, Brent Brent Hall, 9629. Nice show. Uh, Jeff Todd Kobasiuk. Do you know who that is, Jeff Todd? Oh, yeah, Jeff Kob Kobasiuk. Kobasiuk. Jeff Todd our Kobasiuk. Our Canada. Canada. Yeah. Uh, and uh, guitar man, okay. Yeah. And he, he, he's a, a professional guitar player, lifelong rock and roll member, guitar player. And he really loves Victor's total tip sheet. He really loves the black book. And he's been a good, good customer and playbook for a long, long, long time. Well, yes. maybe he can come up with a little ditty on the totals tip sheet and we'll, we'll play it <laughs> on the show. Uh, uh, anyway, Jeff says, Oh, yeah, guys, let's go. Have a great season. Great stuff as always. Uh, and then uh, just three more to go. Ernest Brooks, 399. Thanks for your game breakdowns. Uh, Bruce Cotney, 5190. Great show. Thanks for the info. And X, let's see, the last one is Excel. Let's see. Excel Entertainment, 4738. I have no idea what that's trying to be. Maybe a business name. Good video. I subscribed. So that's the uh, comments. Uh, questions, of course, f uh, uh, and we're going to update these on a weekly basis now. So anything that happens from now on, it'll, it'll be from last week's show. Comments and questions, all that stuff is really cool. It also helps us with our uh, our overall uh, algorithms here on YouTube. The more we can strike conversations, the better. So we appreciate that. And then uh, we started off with the coffee club emails. Uh, and uh, I'll be taking a look at that and updating what I find really interesting on a week-to-week -week ba week -week basis. Just kind of let you know what you're missing uh, if you don't subscribe to the Daily Coffee Club emails. And uh, uh, before I wrap it up, uh, or let Mark wrap it up, I, I, and I usually ask you guys if you have any futures of the week, I'm actually going to give you guys a future. I'm going to give you some from F1, Formula One, futures advice. And this is based on the show I do uh, with uh, C.J. Radun, who's the F1 NASCAR analyst on my show. And he says that he is, because we went over the futures, championship futures, and, and, and if you're familiar at all with F1, Max Verstappen has won three straight championships. And he dominated. Began the year, first half of the year, dominating. All of a sudden, he's kind of come back to the pack. He's, he's not winning. He's finishing fifth, sixth, fourth, but he's not winning. 
So I, I, we were looking over his futures, and it was like, well, I said, like, CJ, man, his futures, are, it's only two, minus 240, minus 230. And again, I never usually go down the road of putting minus money like that. I know Jim Feist does, but I don't. But I, I just got to say, because I asked CJ, I said, well, that sounds too easy to me. What does he have to do to lose the championship? He's so far ahead in points. He goes, the only way he loses is he's got to, like, have wrecks. He's got to, you know, he's got to do everything wrong. And then one of the drivers has got to like, win almost every week. And to me, I just think that's, uh, that's a really, really uh, uh, good play. If you want to go ahead and if you're the type of person that's willing to put up minus a couple hundred, maybe a little bit more than that on a futures, you might want to take advantage of that with Max Verstappen in Formula One. So, so F1, F1 does it different than NASCAR then? Yes, there's no NASCAR playoff. NASCAR has that, uh, yeah, the playoff yep. as opposed to letting the regular season count. Just like PGA does that also. They have the playoff at the end. Yep, no, they used to, NASCAR used to do it that way, uh, but that was about 20 years ago. Yeah. And they've changed. I think it was still called Winston Cup back then. There you go. Hey, guys, it's been a lot of fun. we got to put the stops on this show this particular week. We ran a little bit long the show, but a great show nonetheless. I want to remind all of our listeners out there to hit the like button and subscribe to the show. Also, a note from our producer to remind our viewers to check out the description area of the video where all the links to each of the experts' packages are available and check them out. Until next week, for Mark Lawrence Against the Spread, I'm going to thank our panel of experts for joining us on the show this week. And until then, remember to always to bet with your head, not over it. And good luck as always. <laughs>